Okay, so I think we'll we'll get started. Yeah. Um, my name is Ira Chinoy. I'm the Associate Dean at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, and I'm a co-director of the Future of Information Alliance with Alison Druin, who is a professor in the College of Information Studies at Maryland and has a very cool title of Chief Futurist of the University of Maryland. Um, uh, the Alliance got started in 2011 uh, at the University of Maryland as a to serve as a catalyst for um, discussion, collaboration, research, and action on important issues related to the evolving role of information in our lives. And this week we have a very exciting week of programs uh, organized around the future of the past that will take place here in Baltimore, in Washington, and on campus um, in collaboration with our the Park Service and our nine other partners and with generous support from the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation, who's President and Chief Operating Officer, uh, oh look there, Jane Brown <laughs> and uh, Neil Diedrichson are here somewhere. So thank you for that. Um, so these programs on the future of the past take on a paradox of our times, which is that in the midst of this information explosion going on all, all around us, the information treasures that form a vast part of our cultural heritage are in danger of being uh, neglected, lost, forgotten. And so during this week, we're going to explore ways that new information technologies and new approaches to information about the past uh, can be used to better understand and use the past. And uh, each of our alliance partners uh, plays a role in these discussions during the week. And I'm going to read them to you because I, there are 10 of them, and I'm afraid I will miss one of them, and I don't want to do that. So they are the US National Park Service, the Museum, the National Geographic Society, WAMU 88.5 in Washington, Sesame Workshop, the Smithsonian Institution, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, the Office of the Governor of Maryland, and the Barry School, and many of the representatives here today. This morning's program, Engaging with History, Keeping the Stories Alive and Lively, asks how in an era of declining resources we can best keep the past preserved and alive today for, the, for future generations. Now our speakers, which the Future of Information Alliance um, we call visiting futurists, have backgrounds in history, K-12 through education, and the national parks as sites for learning. You will be introduced to them shortly by our moderator, Dan Russell. Dan is known as Google's Director of User Happiness um, and has been involved in the Future of Informa Information Alliance since its inception um, uh, back in 2010. His title with the FIA is Futurist is in Residence, which I think is actually cooler than my title. Um, he, but he does have a really cool job at Google, uh, which is where he studies how people search the web and then channel his findings back into the evolving design of the Google search engine. We also wanted to let you know that in addition to those of you that are here, uh, we actually have a participatory audience online. Some 200 people at National Park Service sites around the country along with students and faculty on campus and other friends of the Alliance um, off campus are watching this live stream. Actually, these, these mics, for those of you in the room, are not miking this room. These mics are actually for the live feed. So our, our, our um, speakers will actually have to speak as I am today. <clears throat> but anyway, so if you are on the live stream, welcome. Welcome. And uh, the, uh, we have links on our website, uh, fia.umd.edu. And we will, um, and you can actually ask questions and comments via Twitter, email, and posting to Google Plus. And you in the audience can do the same thing as well. Uh, we will monitor these and pass along at least some of the questions to our panel. 
there are two Twitter hashtags to use together, FIA, UMD, and Future of the Past, and you can email them to uh, FIA at uh, cs.umd.edu. Or you can take part in just joining the Future of Information Alliance community uh, at the Google Plus uh, community. So before we begin, um, we do have to thank a few people that have made this possible, uh, particularly John Tobiasen, who uh, is in the back live streaming. John, amazing. Uh, Wendy LaRue, um, also from the National Park Service, uh, both Wendy and John and uh, Don Kodak uh, have been from the inception of doing uh, of, of really even thinking about this program um, have been working together with us. And we have out at the Forge, who are, is now finishing up with um, uh, some local school children, Vince Vase of the National Park Service. We thank him for his leadership as well um, in bringing about this program today. And now, to get us started, we want to turn the mic over to Tina Capetta. Tina is uh, superintendent of Fort McHenry's uh, National Park. But we also found out recently that she is also a Terp. Um, yay, go Terp. She is an alumni from the University of Maryland. And we are so thankful for you uh, for hosting us today. And she has been with the Park Service for 25 years and came here in, in 2011 from Seneca, New York, where she was superintendent of Women's Rights National Historical Park. Tina. Good morning. Welcome. We are um, thrilled to have you here with us this morning. Uh, when Don gave me a call and uh, asked us about hosting, um, we uh, were very happy to um, accept uh, this opportunity. Um, what an exciting thing for us. Um, I am uh, thrilled to be the superintendent here at Fort McHenry National Monument and Historic Shrine, but also at Hampton National Historic Site. And I'm sure as many of you know, we're, over, we're in a national park system of over 400 national parks. And of course, preserving the history of the past is core to our mission. And here at Fort McHenry, we're always looking for innovative ways to preserve that history, but also to utilize innovative ways to reach out, um, especially to young audiences, to connect them with that history. Um, I was just talking a little bit earlier about um, one of the things that we did. We're in the midst of our bicentennial right now. 2014 is um, our bicentennial September. You just came back from the tour. For those of you who are sitting in the room, you just came back from the tour with our Chief of Interpretation, Vince Vase. Um, we celebrate our 200th anniversary next year. And um, to start the bicentennial, last year with a declaration of war, we wanted to do something that would really connect people to the kickoff. But in particular, we were looking for a way to reach out to younger audiences. So we um, decided to you do an online game um, called Cast Your Vote. And it was geared for younger audiences, but we also wanted to make it compelling enough for the adult user as well. It was modeled on the old Hollywood Squares game. And we utilized um, characters. Some of them were real historical figures, such as Francis Scott Key and the president. And some of them were composite characters, uh, a southern woman, a frontiers woman, a wealthy northern merchant, northeastern merchant from Boston. And each of those characters had a perspective. And um, as the user went through and clicked on it, they could listen to that character's perspective about whether or not we should go to war. And in the center was a congressman. And so you, as the user, you would cast your vote in the center of the game once you finish listening to each of those perspectives. So um, it was interesting. Uh, we, we beta tested this with my, uh, my youngest child who was in, uh, he's in sixth grade now. And as he went through and he listened to each one of those, he, he kept changing his mind. 
you know, we'd listen to Francis Scott Key and he'd say, oh, you know, Mom, it's just wrong. It's just wrong to invade another country. You know, we just, we just can't invade Canada. That's just not the right thing to do. And, and then he'd listen to another character and he'd be like, oh, you, you just can't let another country push you around like that, Mom. It's like they're, they're stealing our sailors. We have to go to war. And so as he went through and he listened to each one of those characters, he kept, he kept changing his mind. And at the end, after listening to all the perspectives, he sat there and he said, so if I vote yes, will I have to fight? Will I have to go to war? And he said, okay, even if I have to fight, I'm going to vote yes because you just can't let another country push you around like that because where is it ever going to end? And he clicked yes. And so that's one of the things. And we rolled that out nationwide, worldwide. We rolled it out on the web. And that was the way that we kicked off the declaration of war. And so that's just one of the ways that we are trying to use information in uh, an innovative way even though Hollywood Squares, one would argue, might not be innovative. <laughs> However, he'd never heard of it, so it worked for us. But um, that's one of the ways that we're trying to connect um, information, um, sharing information in an innovative way to connect people with the past. So we're particularly interested in the information that will be shared here today, and we're very happy to have you. Um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. I, my name is Dan Russell, and I'm extremely happy to be here. Uh, part of my mission at Google is to be interested in all things informational. And so as a consequence, we do lots of scanning and indexing and making available interesting archival and historical content. There, that's made available through things like Google Books, the newspaper archives, well, anything we can index that you could then want to look at later. And the interesting question for us is, in many ways, what do we decide to keep now? So if this, the topic of this whole week is the future of the past, what kinds of tracks are we leaving now? If you think about it, you know, Captain's Log, star date September 14th, 1814. Wouldn't you like to have that to understand what was going on? But unfortunately, they didn't have Captain's Logs in the way that we can easily index them. They're in an unfortunate format now. And so we have this interesting set of problems about transforming forms, about looking and trying to discover the happy accidents of the past. So at Google, our, one of our interesting questions now is, so how do we make the future of the past less accidental? Do we, for example, keep track of all the queries that are made to Google? Wouldn't the historian of, say, 3,000 really want to know that? Yes, they probably would. So it's an interesting question from our perspective. So I'm really happy to be here, and we'll be talking about issues like this this entire week. But today we have a fascinating panel, and I want to introduce you to them. Um, our first speaker today will be Stephanie Toothman, and she is the Associate Director for Cultural Resources for the National Park Service. Dr. Toothman oversees efforts to develop policy and promote use of the Parks Service's vast and diverse historic and cultural properties. These include 27,000 historic structures and tens of thousands of archaeological sites, artifacts, and archives. Her efforts help facilitate the research that goes into preserving and sharing stories about history surrounding those properties. Next on our agenda will be uh, Bert Kumaro, who leads the Maryland Historical Society as the president and CEO. The Society houses more than 50,000 square feet of exhibits in a library with 7 million books, maps, photographs, periodicals, oral histories, and original documents. Bert has experience in history with both scholarly and public venues as a writer, speaker, public television producer, and museum director. Amy Rosencrantz is the Director of Humanities at Baltimore College Public Schools, and in that role, she works with the librarians and teachers across a range of programs and disciplines advanced placement, English as a second language, social studies, world and classical languages, and visual and performing arts. We'll begin today by turning this over to Stephanie Toothman. Now, our for format will be that our panel members will speak each for about 10 minutes, and we'll then go to directly to the next person. 
At the end, we'll have a time for questions, and we'll uh, be doing those here. But we'll also be paying attention to the inputs through social media. So now, let me turn over to Dr. Toothman. Thank you, Dan. Um, I have 88,000 entries on the National Register of Historic Places. Can we talk afterwards? Because <laughs> I'm trying to make them more accessible right now to, um, as a gift to the nation in terms of the amount of information uh, contained in those entries. But I'd also uh, like to thank um, everyone who's been involved in putting this together for um, inviting me to participate. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge um, my colleague Julie Washburn, who is covering another event today, who uh, is the Associate Director for Interpretation and Education, and Don Kodak, who is here representing her in uh, Harpers Ferry. Um, I want to acknowledge her be because Julie and I have embarked on a partnership. We both arrived in D.C. about the same time in 2010. And we very much are on the same page in terms of the importance of um, reaching out to new audiences, of making sure that the programs that we present are based on great research, and making them both exciting and lively. So. Um, I want to thank John Robinson as well for helping me put together the PowerPoint. And uh, my PowerPoint skills are a little bit more basic than what we required today. So with, um, let's see, what do I need to click here? Which do I click? OK. So with um, thanks to John, I hope I will do um, justice to his work today in terms of helping me put this together. I'd just like to start with reviewing the, the uh, mission of the National Park Service, which is to preserve unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. The Park Service cooperates with partners to extend the benefits of natural and cultural resource conservation and outdoor recreation throughout this country and the world. Our programs, as I mentioned, um, interpretation and education, natural and cultural research, resource research, are collaborating to an unprecedented extent to provide students and visitors of all ages opportunities to experience our national parks in ways that reflect both current research and promote engagement in discussing the meaning of the complex ideas and experiences that our park represent. As we move into taking on more and more challenging stories, and uh, one that we may be getting in the near future is um, uh, the Manhattan Project National Historic Park, which is currently in Congress. Um, we know that we have to raise our game quite a bit in order to be able to tell a story that is so complex, so controversial, and yet change the world. And how do we engage people to talk about their perspectives, to share their stories, to make this interesting, and to make sure that what we say is accurate? So I'd like to present three programs today, just snippets. I think you'll find them all very lively and engaging that represent some of the lively, we're going to use that word a lot today, and creative interactions going on throughout the systems. Programs that take advantage of the authenticity of place, which we in the National Park Service feel we really have a lock on that in terms of being able to, as uh, Vince told the kids today, this is the actual fort. Um, that represent new levels of engagement with stories and resources represented by the parks and use digital tools to support these goals. Okay, we're... Okay. So the first one I'd like to talk about today is a program that has been a collaboration between the Journey Through Hallowed Ground which is one of our 49 heritage areas created by Congress. These heritage areas connect parks 
and uh, communities within a defined region that are thematically related, and they help to preserve those resources through collaboration um, and promoting heritage tourism, marketing, things that will help sustain a community and sustain the story at the same time. They've been working with middle schoolers uh, in several of our parks, including Harpers Ferry and Manassas, to engage the students in understanding the issues associated with the Civil War, and in this case, to make connections between the issues faced by Irish immigrants deciding whether to re-enlist and their fellow students who share their experiences as first-generation immigrants. The students research the primary documents, write their own scripts, make their own costumes, and create their videos on the NPS site. So one of the challenges that we had as we approached the 150th anniversary of the Civil War is not only to have a respectful commemoration for all of the people who participated in the war, for the more than 600,000 people who lost their lives during the war, but to also make connections with today's stories. And this is what I think, and, and I really urge you to go on YouTube to see it, this video does so incredibly well. In terms of the students, as I said, they did the research in primary documents, they wrote the script, they made the connections between the experiences of Irish immigrants who had been dragooned into or lured into enlisting to serve, and um, they, they made those connections with the experiences of the students that they were in classes with every day. They had an incredibly fun time making the costumes, playing, um, you know, there's a picture of them, three little boys sitting in front of the tents in their uniforms, and you can see it a little bit of it over there, whittling away and doing everything that they thought that soldiers should do. But it's more than that. It's more than, um, you know, putting on the video in terms of the long-term consequences. We found, for example, at Harper's Ferry, when they did a similar project there, that many of the kids who were initially involved had never really understood they were in a national park. By the time they went through this program and went through the whole process of, of understanding the place that they lived in, they became some of the park's strongest proponents. They actually took ownership of that park, and many of them have continued to be engaged in the with the park in future, you know, as they pass out of middle school into high school. That's where we're building our constituency, but we're building a constituency that has an understanding of the issues that is built on their engagement and thinking about them, not just listening to a very canned lecture about here's what happened, who did it. They've thought about it, they've engaged in thinking about what it means to them today. When we started, as I said, with the Civil War commemoration, I remember talking with our director, John Jarvis, about how we made those connections. And his idea was is that if we told the story properly and really encouraged people to, to make those connections, that this would be important even to new citizens, people who are escaping their own civil wars, to see what we went through and to see how you come out of it and what the lessons learned. So this is one example that I wanted to share with you. The next one is 
it's not only really fun. When I first put this on my computer and turned up the volume, people came running from all directions to, to see what was going on. But it's also when you listen to the words, and again, I'm only going to play a clip, you understand that those students, and they're uh, a group of young people from New, Be New Bedford, Massachusetts, really understood the story and the emotions of soldiers of the 51st Re Regiment. And I hope you can get this louder. Um. Y'all know, y'all, y'all the only family I've got. And, uh, I love you, this part. We in the 54th Regiment, all black soldiers, and who will we got it? My race on our shoulder, the top of my crowd, my head, and my shoulder. We the 54th Regiment, all black soldiers, and who will we got it? My race on our shoulder, the top of my crowd, my head, and my shoulder. Yes, see, go, see, go, Proud black man with the 54th Regiment, front line fighting for my right to be a Confederate. Once was a slave, but the time of being a veteran. And if I die in line, at least y'all get to see my resume. Trying to make it sweet, let's get these shoes off my feet. Oh, we both see the beat, cause we trying to be free. Freedom at last, yep, freedom at last. This party stands tall with the flag, so all this back and dead. They keep fighting, yeah, they keep fighting. Treated like dirt, wounded but never hurt. They stick together. I'm going to encourage you to go to the app site to hear the whole song because it's really hard not to start bouncing around up here listening to it. Um, these are five kids who are incredibly talented but who also have, through their voice, through using a contemporary medium, an incredible ability to connect with, not only with other kids but with audiences that don't usually engage with us. Uh, they did a performance this um, summer at Fort DuPont here in, Was in Washington, and they had done several other um, songs that they, or raps that they had created, and I'm dating myself by not using the same la right language, so excuse me. Um, but they were, they were really incredible, and yet the words are accurate. They convey a sense of uh, emotion. They have power that I don't think that... Um, we achieve in, often in our in our normal interpretation. They reach um, for those of you who live in the area who went to the new exhibit at the National Gallery on the St. Gaudens Shaw Memorial. Totally different experience, but definitely as powerful in terms of understanding the experiences of the members of the cavalry, and again connecting to a different audience. So I would. Uh, again, suggest that you take a look at it. The last project that I wanted to talk about is one that's uh, very dear to me. I spent most of my career in the um, Pacific Northwest and as part of that worked very closely with Fort Vancouver, which about 10 years ago was kind of at the bottom of the heap in terms of it was one of those parks that often came up on the list of parks we could do without. Uh, the local community wrote a headline, Fort Nowhere, and then part of the problem was is that it was very narrowly focused in its interpretation. They spent a lot of time doing living history and costumes and baking scones and really not reaching out to a broader audience or connecting um, in any way, and particularly connecting the resource that's at Fort Vancouver to um, help people understand how one progresses from the archaeology to the research and the interpretation and the preservation of those articles. So uh, this is an app that was developed and was award-winning. I think it got, it got the, um, I forget which award it got, Freeman Tilden in the Hertzart War. It was developed by the uh, Chief Ranger slash historian Greg Shine in partnership with um, 
and the park has partnerships with the Washington State University Clark College in Portland State, and it was intended to to reach out much more broadly to, even though they get about a million visitors a year, uh, to really talk about why Fort Ben Fort Vancouver was important. And Fort Vancouver, for those of you who don't know it, is really considered to be the premier historical archaeological site in the Pacific Northwest. The park was created in order to preserve the story of the Hudson's Bay Company. When we inherited it, it was basically an airport. Um, what the park has been able to do through these apps is to be able to begin to tell the layers of story that that one piece of ground represents from the pre-contact era, thousands of years of occupation, to the Hudson's Bay Company, to the Vancouver Barracks, which was the locus for troops fighting the Indian Wars, World War I, Spruce Plain production, World War II embarkation site, right up to uh, the last couple of years when the fort was finally uh, relinquished from the Army. So I have three more minutes, so real quickly. Um, this is the fort as it would have looked during its heyday. Uh, at one point, the village on the right side here, the Kanaka village, was the most populated village or area west of the Mississippi. Um, it had about 900 residents at its peak, and they were an incredibly multicultural uh, group. The fort itself is over here. Well, today, uh, through a congressional mandate, we have reconstructed many of the buildings through painstaking research. and. Um, use of original techniques and materials. And um, the, the Fort app really allows you to experience the whole process of archaeology, how it informs interpretation. And uh, John was kind enough to dig out these photographs. On the upper left is archaeologist uh, Doug Wilson recovering a piece of coral from the site of Kanaka Williams House. Uh, one of the many multicultural groups at the village were Kanakas or Hawaiians, and their descendants still live in the area today. So you can see the, the excavation site in the app itself, which is on the bottom left. You have an actor recreating Kanaka William and the fact that he brought that piece of coral with him to remind him of his home. And then you have so you have that whole interpretation sequence that's shown in the app from in the ground to understanding what it was to being used as an interpretive piece. Um, the mobile project is also very interesting and I wanted to share it with you today because it has been backed by a lot of research. Um, the professor who helped, whose class helped develop it also um, has been doing studies of how the visitors are using it. And uh, what's there's even a fake phone over there, but just in quick summary, he found that the app exponentially increased visitors' engagement with the resource. From, for the unaccompanied visitor, to the visitor who might have a brochure, to the visitor who had the app, it went from an engagement of about four minutes max at a particular site to about 20, where they would be taking their iPads and their phones and walking around the building, holding it up, comparing the information, and getting incredible layers. So for, for me as um, a cultural anthropologist and historian, this is an incredible way to present the layers of our stories. Um, without cluttering them with waysides and signs. It's an incredible way to reach out to multiple audiences, long distance, as well as on site. So what are some of the challenges? Well, one of the challenges for me is to uh, keep my iPad up. But let me just go um, real quickly here, and I think we'll have more of a chance to discuss it, is that all of these projects are often based on the interest and excitement of one individual on a park staff. We have a lot of challenges in terms of developing the capacity and the sustainability of the apps. A second challenge is the amazingly 
quick evolution of the software and, and the technology. So we just get a park on Facebook and somebody, and the next thing, you know, we're like three technologies behind. We're not doing, and we can't often even use the new technology because it hasn't been cleared. Um, we're concerned that the material that's presented does meet our, our standards. And again, um, that, that's a challenge in terms of our standards being that it's based on good research, that it's well done, and, and again, when you have 400 parks and a lot of folks kind of doing this on their own because they're really excited and interested, the quality is very variable. We also have a lot of folks coming to us, and uh, this is not meant to be a negative comment, but one firm, SciArc, has been engaging with a number of our parks to present how you can use point clouds to do some incredible recreations of um, sites, Fort Union, Mount Rushmore, a whaling house at New Bedford. As a manager, and I know this sounds like doom and gloom, my first response is, so do we own this as intellectual property? Who's going to maintain this incredible data set? Who has the equipment and the knowledge to do it? Um, when the software advances, who's going to make sure it advances with it? So I'm sure we'll explore some of these other questions. Um, as we uh, go forward today, but those are some, just a peek at some of the exciting things that we're doing with technology today. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Brooke Kumaro from the Maryland Historical Society. Great. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, get this out of the way here. I'd like to start by uh, talking about my first ex one of my first experiences in my professional career. I was a seasonal ranger um, at um, Gettysburg. His, uh, they called us uh, ranger historians. And uh, I was out on the battlefield one day uh, in the hot weather, excited about answering any question that might come along. And uh, a car drove up, and uh, a man jumped out of the car. and ran over and said, this is it. This is this is what Pickett made his charge. And uh, there was a lady in the car fanning herself. It was a very hot day uh, with the park brochure. And uh, obviously not very happy about being there. And uh, she was heard to say, Pickett Snicket. Who gives a shit? <laughs> and uh, that was a defining moment for me. It really was. Because <laughs> I learned a couple of very important things. One was, is it possible to find a way to teach some history to this hot and bored lady? And are some people just not interested in the past? Um, those are really, really important questions, obviously, because we're all in this business of trying to get people interested in what we're, uh, what we're doing. I've carried this message and this lesson through my whole career. And it started out in the academy uh, as a historian. And then I became a public history pioneer. And I benefited from a varied education, which is very important, I think, to anybody who gets in this business. I studied classical history when I first uh, went into graduate school and spent a lot of time working on places like Pompeii. And every shred of evidence that's available to a classic, classical historian is used, uh, from archaeology to uh, uh, epigraphy. Uh, everything uh, has, has a meaning. And um, when I was in, in graduate school, I think the the academy was more interested in documents than anything else. And so there was a real sea change going on in the 60s. And I got into the American Studies program at the National Museum of American History. And um, that really showed me that artifacts have a lot to tell us, especially if we know how to use them. Um, and then I got into reenacting as well. And that uh, was a defining thing for me because uh, putting life into the artifacts and the culture and uh, I'm proud to be honored as an early authentic, that's what they call me, uh, back in the 60s when uh, we were sort of pioneers in this business. Um, I learned a lot about how to teach the public. Uh, and there's a lot of silliness that goes on in reenactment too. But uh, there, there are things that you can really learn from that. And it became a defining thing for me as well. And then I went on to uh, producing television shows all sorts of living history demonstrations. Uh, I directed, mu uh, directed museums. And um, I worked on a really obscure subjects like 17th century Maryland. 
And I've also written books, and uh, I've talked to all manner of audiences. So the whole idea is to get as much as you can and put it out there. And uh, where am I now? Well, I'm still fascinated by the process after half a century of trying to bring history to the public. And there's a sea change going on right now. Everybody knows about it. The public money, once so prevalent, is drying up. We probably have way too many historic houses and museums. And consolidation and partnerships is in our future, and it's already going on. Um, there's accelerating te technology, which is just mentioned. Uh, and uh, it's throwing us all into a certain amount of confusion. Funds are short, and we're all reaching out to a limited pool of supporters. Um, and uh, we're far behind the sexier causes like health, religion, and helping humans in need. So uh, getting into that pool of, um, of sources is, uh, is, is a difficult struggle. And yet the situation, in one important way, never changes. And that way it, uh, is, is all about sitting around the campfire, swapping stories, powerful stories, and all the technology in the world will not change that. In fact, it can make it even better if technology is properly used. We, above all, are social animals. And uh, we're eager to share our experiences and our knowledge with other audiences. And um, along with friends and family, it becomes an important part of our lives on a regular basis. There was an important 1990s study called the Museum Experience, which came out of Annapolis. Um, and it determined that our potential audiences for history can be divided into three camps. This has been going on, of course, in the marketing world for a long time. 15%, according to them, uh, are our primary and devoted audience. 35% will come to exhibits and events that are part of the collective memory, like King Tut or Johannes Vermeer right now in New York. And you can all forget about the other 50%. Uh, that was what they said. You, you can't really get them. They're not all that interested. Um, I began to believe uh, that all this hysteria about people not uh, losing their history is kind of overblown. I agree that schools are doing a poor job, but most of the world has always lived in the here and now and cares little about who was first president or whether the Civil War was fought in the middle of the 19th century. I think it's one of the Achilles heels of democracy as well. It's dependence on an educated electorate. When you get a 50% turnout at the election polls, and that's certainly fairly common, it indicates at least half the population doesn't care uh, to know enough or, or know enough to participate as fully engaged citizens. That may be depressing for those of us who are politically engaged, but I think all of us would be happy if we could attract 50% of our potential audience. I feel stronger that, uh, than ever that we can, uh, by using the many tools at our command for old-fashioned storytelling, really achieve our goals. You may have noticed uh, not long ago a very smart director of the British Museum has received international attention for his recent history of the world in 100 objects. The hundredth object, by the way, is a credit card. I will go quickly through my own mini history here of uh, Maryland with a few objects just to give you an idea how you can use these objects to engage. So we go ahead here by pushing. Right. Which one? Right hand, okay. Uh, the right hand side of the circle, of course. You got to go right here, huh? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. We have a historical society that goes back to the very beginning of America. And when you look at an object like this, uh, it can be, you know, it can be very exciting just because of what it is. It survived all these years. It is the actual patent of nobility that was given to Lord Baltimore uh, when he became the Baron of Baltimore in Ireland. And uh, it just survived by a fluke with a bunch of cover papers. What it indicates to us is the beginning of a story about how in the world that crazy looking uh, state, Maryland, was created uh, out of the Stuart politics that were going on in the 17th century. And so this becomes a really good uh, vehicle to talk about the very beginnings of Maryland and how it all happened. We go on to uh, some of our other treasures here at the, uh, at, at the Maryland Historical Society how American industry was created and how these beautiful objects that came out of the 18th century 
uh, were all about uh, immigrants coming to America. This is the Amelo and Glassworks out in Frederick County. And um, how this can become a story that we can tell is very, very powerful as well about how American entrepreneurship was born. This particular document came out of our seven million documents that we have in the library, um, indicates for the first time that a bunch of people had signed this document in 1776. This is the first time they all got into print and they all suffered as a result of it. You know, the English were not fond of people rebelling against them and they had executed the people in Scotland uh, severely in the, or in, in the middle of the 18th century. So that these people were putting their lives on the line. It's a great story to tell. This was actually produced here in Baltimore by a female, uh, one of two in Maryland that, uh, that actually uh, were printers in the 18th century taking over from their husbands. And we go on to the development of, of course, the uh, American uh, ex ex experience uh, from the Revolution and uh, John Eager Howard who owned most of what is now the Mount Vernon district in the 18th century. And uh, we have a letter from uh, George Washington giving him the, uh, the ancestor of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, it's called the Comedia Americana. We have a flag, one of the few flags that survives from the uh, revolution. You can see the U.S. on it, given to um, a, a Polish uh, immigrant who uh, volunteered his services after fighting uh, for Poland's freedom and became, uh, became a hero of the revolution killed at Savannah, Kazimir Pulaski. And uh, this particular thing looks a little bit, I know, like a uh, less like a flag and more like a rug, but it's a, it's a very powerful statement on uh, what was going on in the revolution when we got volunteers to help us. And one of the few surviving Revolutionary War uniforms. It's more of a story about the Tillman family because the colonel who was the chief of staff of, uh, of Washington all through the revolution left behind his uniform because he died young and his wife would bring these things out every year as, uh, as relics of, of her experience with him. So what we have here is not only a very rare uh, artifact but also a story of a particular family. And uh, a, a famous cabinet maker in Annapolis who produced uh, the, uh, the furniture for uh, the Senate chamber where Washington resigned his commission. And uh, Benjamin Banneker, the self-taught astronomer from Ellicott City, who uh, actually printed and published with Catherine Goddard, the one who did the Declaration of Independence, the, uh, the uh, almanacs which became uh, so important in the early, uh, not only early history of science in America, but also a self-taught black man who became um, a correspondent with Thomas Jefferson and proceeded to uh, ask, uh, ask for his attention to the fact that black men were as smart as white men. Thomas Jefferson's own a drawing of what the capital should like, look like and all the opinions that went into that. We have one particular drawing that has a big, looks like a chicken on the top of it. Uh, and uh, we have the whole set of drawings that were included in the competition for the, uh, for the capital. I just can't, you can't see this very well, but here's the, uh, the beginning of science in America when uh, Charles Wilson Peale went up and dug up some mastodons trying to figure out what the, what the bones were. And uh, this famous uh, artist also was engaged in all kinds of natural history. And uh, this has become one of our best artifacts. It goes regularly out to various museums around the country. Furniture. This Baltimore became a, a great center for furniture making, almost as great as, uh, as uh, New York. And uh, this is the work of William Camp for a Jewish family that uh, was here in uh, Baltimore that uh, could afford, uh, because of their successes, the, uh, the uh, wonderful furniture that he was creating. This gets us to the most important artifact we have. We've got four minutes, three minutes left, so I'm going to have to move quickly. Uh, but this is the one I wanted to end on, and th this particular um, uh, artifact is the actual document that was written by Francis Scott Key when he was released by the British in 1814. And this becomes obviously a great icon for America. So what does it lead to? Well, it leads to something we did this last summer, which I think was fascinating. Um, we actually uh, reproduced the Star Spangled Banner at, at our museum uh, with a bunch of uh, stitchers. 
uh, ladies who are quilters, and uh, it became one of our, our uh, best things we've ever done with regard to um, crowdsourcing and, and getting people invited. We had thousands of people put their stitches in this flag, and it all gets back to this amazing story about how in the world they stopped the, uh, the British attack here at Fort McHenry. So um, you can see that we have enormous objects that we can play with and we can work with and we can actually sell stories with. And uh, I think the whole point here is that uh, the top-down curatorial exhibits that we've had up till now, uh, they certainly invite worship of the objects, but um, they really uh, are giving way to a trend to bringing an object forward to tell a story, making it relevant to a modern theme or question, so the audience can experience it as a real and strong link to our ancestors. We must sell the idea we are in a continuum and we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. So like many other institutions, Maryland Historical Society is stepping back, looking at good ideas being used in other institutions, and there certainly are many, and asking our audiences, young and old, what they want. You probably already know if you ask an audience, you'll get an earful. Our own five-year plan, and I don't think you can go much beyond that because of the uh, technology, which is changing so quickly. Um, I saw a piece last night on 60 Minutes about Amazon, maybe some of you saw it, that uh, will convince you that things are moving very, very quickly. Um, but we're building our, our future on three platforms. We have a large physical plant. We've got to do something with it. It's a whole block. We have to use it intelligently. Provide a, it, it, it provides a base of authenticity for us uh, and for everything else. Hundreds of thousands of artifacts, um, uh, millions of documents, all of that can be used quite successfully to sell this story and um, a new and nimble and imaginative set of exhibits linked to popular reactions is still the basis for everything else. Uh, we must engage in lifelong learning, still inviting our audience from kindergarten to elder hostel to Rhodes Scholar, and um, that is uh, hugely important to us. Live docents, live history, uh, living history guides are all hugely important in the old-fashioned way, but we also have these tools like television to interact, interact with distance learning. And then finally we get to the final leg of the stool, a museum without walls, embracing technology to crowdsource with websites, Facebooks, Twitters, and whatever else the future holds. We have to be careful not to chase after the newest shiny thing because you can spend a lot of money on something and it won't work. Um, you have to have a firm idea of how you're going to use it for a strategic theme. So I'm bullish on the future. If we just remember, we now have many tools to embrace our, our uh, main time-honored mission, and that's gathering around the campfire, telling each other great stories about our ancestors. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to now introduce Amy Rosencrantz from the, uh, she's the Director of Humanities for the Baltimore City Public Schools. Amy. Good morning. I must admit that when I was first asked to speak on this panel, I was a bit taken aback. First, I'd never heard of the Future of Information Alliance, and second, I'd never really thought of myself as a futurist. I'm an educator, not some tech guru kind of person, but having been recommended for this by Ranger extraordinaire Vince Vase, I knew that I had to be involved in this. And as an aside, Dan, Vince and I were talking this morning, we think his title should be changed to Director of Visitor Happiness. Uh. <laughs> so as I was preparing for this presentation, I began to think about what we do in Baltimore City Schools and realized that educators are the ultimate futurists. We deal in the business of making sure that our kids are given the resources that they need to be ready for a future that is yet unknown. In an urban school system, that business is especially important and particularly challenging. As Director of Humanities for City Schools, it's my job to make sure that our students have access to world-class education in the social sciences. In an educational atmosphere that is more focused on mathematics and STEM, that's a responsibility that is very daunting. But in a city and a region with incredible cultural resources and partners, we've made great strides in making that happen for our students. So what have we done in city schools to help our students engage with history? What have we done to help our teachers keep the stories alive and lively? 
Well, we believe that our students must be active learners, and in the area of history, they must do history. They must learn the skills that the actual historians use. And those skills, by the way, match perfectly with the reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills that are identified in the Common Core State Standards. During history, doing history, involves more than just reading books and watching movies, as some of us probably did in our old history classrooms. During history involves getting out into the field, experiencing historic sites, and interacting with historic documents and artifacts. Recent research tells us that field trips are an integral part of education. A uh, University of Arkansas study has found that students who took field trips to art museums demonstrated stronger critical thinking skills, displayed higher levels of social tolerance, exhibited greater historical empathy, and developed a taste for art museums and cultural institutions. Moreover, most of the benefits that they found were significantly larger for minority students and low-income students, actually two to three times larger than those for white suburban children, owing perhaps to the fact that the tour was the first time that they'd ever visited a museum. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that field trips to historic sites and museums reap the same type of benefits. And it's our belief in city schools and our various partners that we work with every day that the importance of field work and doing history undergirds what we do for our teachers and for our students. So I could speak for hours about what we do in Baltimore City Schools and at, behind me you're seeing pictures of a lot of things that have been going over on for the past couple of years, but I'm going to highlight a couple of things that I find very exciting and important to what we're doing. They include teacher training, field trips and project and place-based learning, interdisciplinary work, and probably more importantly, partnerships. It's a basic fact that teachers must first understand a topic before they can successfully teach it. We in city schools have worked really hard to make sure that our teachers know and understand the history that we expect them to teach. This has led to a series of history academies and field trips that have crisscrossed across the mid-Atlantic for the past couple of years. Over the past years, we've traveled um, with our War of 1812 Academy, our Civil War Academy, and various field trips almost anywhere you can imagine. We've walked in the footsteps of many American heroes at places at, like Mount Vernon and Ellis Island, and we've also investigated the nooks and crannies of Baltimore at places like Green Mount Cemetery and the Fire Museum of Maryland. Those local experiences are especially important for our teacher corps here in Baltimore City because the majority of our teachers are not from Baltimore and the majority are not from Maryland. So we have to make sure that they truly understand the Maryland experience so that our students can learn about it. I feel confident that our teachers have a much better understanding of history and appreciation for historic sites based on these many experiences. And that helps them to provide a much higher quality learning experience for our kids. Which leads to field trips, project-based learning, place-based learning, service learning, all the things that we do with, around our curriculum in social studies in Baltimore City. Once our teachers have seen and done history themselves, they're ready to help our students do history. As you know, we have outstanding partners, many of them are in the room here in Baltimore City, and they work hard to help us provide incredible experiences for our teachers and for our students. When we talk about field trips, we go all across the city and all across the state, but some of our most important partners and one of the most important sites that we use is here at Fort McHenry. And a, and a great partnership that we've had over the past two years is the Friends of Fort McHenry has done a 200 for 200 experience where they're helping us fund field trips for 200 schools every single year of the bicentennial. And if you know anything about what makes field trips difficult, it's finding the money for entrances and especially buses. We also have the opportunity every single year on Young Defenders Day to bring over a thousand of our students out here to experience much of what you saw today with Ranger Vince actually doing the history at the fort. And the Historical Society, I can't forget, is also a fantastic partner in allowing our children to come into the archives, our students, our teachers to come into the archives and help them really work with documents and research the history of what they need to know which has led to an exciting new project that we're doing in Baltimore City, uh, a service learning project that we've built right into our grade eight 
U.S. History Curriculum, which is a history field day. Last year, we, f we piloted a history field day in Patterson Park with one school where fifth graders got to learn everything there was to learn about the War of 1812, and they taught it to the community. And they actually had a field day. And um, you can see pic you'll see pictures behind us of the boat that they actually built, the uniforms that they made, the guns that they did. They even did a reenactment video that you can find on YouTube. I didn't have time to show it to you guys today. But on YouTube of the entire experience of War 18 of 1812 that they had learned. We're going to continue that history field day across the city, and we're making it bigger this year with a grant from the Baltimore National Heritage Area where students were actually going to be from different schools. We're going to have 10 different schools this year. It research a different aspect of the War of 1812 and present it to fifth graders across the city as well as in the community. We've also had the great opportunity to work with the Star Spangled Banner Trail. And one of our schools had the great experience of working to create and design the placards in the Patterson Park area. So the actual National Park Service placards were inspired by fifth graders in Baltimore City. So that was hugely exciting for our kids. And this year, we're also moving to expand our participation in National History Day with partners like the Maryland Historical Society, the Maryland Humanities Council, goodness, I'm running out of time already, um, to really infuse project learning into our classroom. We know that when kids get to do the history, they get super excited and they'll love it forever. All of those activities also combine our interdisciplinary connections. Um, you've seen, and, and Ranger Tim is in the back, we had an incredible partnership with the fort last year that started with music historical music and students from Booker T. Washington Middle School were, fight, were part of the Fife and Drum Corps. That was just amazing, amazing. We've also had students work with author illustrator Timothy Penland and they are the illustrators of his new book, The Night Before the Battle of Baltimore, that's going to be published soon and be here in the fall for the 200th anniversary. All of those things that I've mentioned and those are just um, like the icing on the cake, the very tip top of what we've been doing, would not be possible without our partnerships. And I think that is a really important thing for us to think about today is partnerships. Because if we all work together to leverage, then we can really make a difference. So lots of exciting things are happening in city schools, but even more can happen. As you may have noticed, I did not speak of the use of technology or virtual field trips. And that was a purposeful decision. Our students are rarely afforded non-school opportunities to leave their neighborhoods and to visit historic or cultural sites. And I believe that it's imperative that city schools offer them that opportunity. But, and as the research that I earlier quoted noted, urban and low-income students reap the most benefits from field trips. So we must continue to get our kids out to the historic sites, or they may never, ever get there. They might just live up the street, but unless we at school bring them to the fort, they're never going to be able to experience that history. But having said that, we also find that our students have the least opportunity to interact with modern technology at home. So this leaves me and my colleagues in, in a bit of a quandary. How do we provide both types of experiences for them? So this year, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing the service learning project with the History Field Day. And much like the, the In Hollowed Ground tour, which we're taking some inspiration from, the kids will be documenting their research with video and creating actual videos um, about their research and we're looking towards apps as well, so I'm looking for some inspiration and some experience with that. It's my hope that through the discussion today and the many partners here that I can have some ideas for how to incorporate that technology and those on-site experiences as well. So I want to thank you for inviting me here today and I look forward to hearing more about what we can do for city schools. So I'd, I'd like to invite our panelists, Stephanie and Bert and uh, Amy, if you'd come up to the front table here. And I, you know, uh, Amy, I really like your, your, your phrase, educators have the ultimate futurists. And one of the themes that I've heard throughout each of these talks is the notion of being able to communicate effectively, to tell a story. So let me tell you a story. 
uh, we're here, and Francis Scott Key is an important guy, but you know, his son was actually a really interesting character in American history as well. So his son was uh, Philip Barton Key, and you may or may not know that he was actually uh, murdered in Lafayette Park. Yeah, that Lafayette Park down by the down by the White House, and he was shot dead by uh, Dan Sickles. It turns out apparently. Uh, Philip was having an affair with Dan Sickles' wife, and in a jealous rage, he shot him dead. Right now, the reason that's an interesting story, and the reason I'm asking, I'm putting it as a preface for your question, it's an interesting story because Dan Sickles mounted what was apparently the very first uh, plea for a reason of insanity for murder in the United States. Okay, so there's an interesting connection between the place we're at and a legal precedent. So interesting story, but I want to uh, actually use that as a frame before you object to my question. And I want to turn. I wanted to go first to Amy, and then we'll go to Stephanie, and then then you can move. But um, so you gave in, in your your talk an interesting comment about the Manhattan Project, and that's a di difficult, complex, big, sophisticated story. So my question to you is, how can we use our best practices for creating stories for our patrons, for our customers, for our students, in a way that communicates these good, deep ideas in, a, in an effective way. So can you use the microphone here? So how do we best... How, what's the best way to tell a rich, deep, interesting story that doesn't overrun the capacities for our students? Well, I think first and foremost, um, the best way to teach a story or to tell a story is um, to have an exciting story and to be excited in teaching it. So we had a prime example of uh, Ranger Vince today. If he had not been excited about what he was teaching today, and if it had not been relevant, relevance is also another key thing, um, we wouldn't have been interested in hearing what was going on. So excitement and then relevance. If it's right. not relevant to students' experience or to people's experience, they're not going to want to listen. Very good. I'm not going to use Manhattan Project because we haven't figured that one out yet. Um, but I will say, uh, several years ago for the bicentennial of Lewis and Clark, Fort, Fort Clatsop, which was a reconstruction of their winter camp, burned to the ground two weeks before. And so we were uh, challenged um, in terms of did we, would we reconstruct it and what would it look like? Because when it was first reconstructed, they used a sketch from William Clark's um, notes. Subsequent research in other people's diaries indicated that maybe it wasn't actually built as William Clark had sketched. So our dilemma was, how do we reconstruct it and how do we engage the visitor in this new research? And what we decided to do was basically make that a question to the visitor. So now when a visitor goes to Fort Clatsop, which we actually reconstructed on the uh, William Clark model for a number of reasons, including finances, they are confronted with the question, here's what William and Clark sketched, but here's what another sergeant said they built. Here's what another sergeant said they built. Based on all that evidence, what do you think the fort looked like? And the, the visitor is invited to take that and whether it be a student or, you know, an elder hostel person and come up with their own solution. And we right. find that that engages them in a way that they hadn't even thought about in the past. So you're making it relevant by engaging the visitor. And the whole process of Very research good. and analysis is brought to them through that question. Thank you. Bert, what would you say? You know, the Army has a saying, uh, keep it simple, stupid, and uh, kiss. And um, I think you do, I mean, you can get involved in the details so quickly. And like you were talking about, you know, that Edwin Stanton was um, was Dan Sickles' uh, uh, lawyer, uh, the, the future Secretary of War. Right. So you got all these connections back and forth. I mean, people and Dan who come Sickles here, was an interesting guy, too. Yeah. Exactly. Crazy Civil War. Very, 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 very interesting. Uh, but... You know, just just making the point of why Francis Scott Key was out in the British fleet during this whole thing is complicated. I mean, um, and uh, these kind of stories are, you know, I, I think you have to find hooks. You got to find things that are 
you know, they're going to grab them. And uh, most of this has to do with just um, finding uh, something human about what's going on, you know. Uh, I mean, around here you have so many opportunities because you can go out there to the water battery and you can imagine with Vince's help and others and, uh, and others' help, uh, imagine what it must have been like here with the whole British fleet sitting out there. Mm -hmm. So we're back to this whole thing of telling stories again, you know, going to the places where it happened. I think that's really, really critical because it gives you so many opportunities. But I think you do have to keep it as simple as you can. And, I, and a lot of times that's very difficult because we have a tendency to fall into very complicated right. sort of patterns. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So this is our opportunity for the studio audience to ask questions. And I think the simplest way to do this, you know, following the KISS principle, is that if you would ask your question, I will then repeat it for the video, put it for the video audience. So keep your questions interesting, relevant, simple, <laughs> and engaging, if you could. Any questions from the local audience? Otherwise, do we have people monitoring social media in the back? Yeah. They're going to pass me a, a slate device while you're thinking your question. So um, we have one question here from uh, Dominic who asks, uh, should the National Park Service concentrate more on teacher field trips rather than curriculum for student field trips? What would you say? We'll turn this over to you, Stephanie. I would say I don't want to make that choice. <laughs> I would say I think they're both equally valid and they're complementary. But again, going back to my initial remarks when I talked about our commitment to our interpretation being based on the best research, if the teacher has an opportunity to be exposed to that research, um, not to have to rely on the textbook, to, ha to have engaged and thinking about it through a teacher field trip, then her students will benefit when they do their own field trip. And then I'll talk to the ex expert here in terms of teacher and student. Okay, Amy, what would you say? What would you be your recommendation? I would agree that you would need both. Yeah. Definitely need both because teachers need to understand the history of the place first and then have them have something developed to help students understand it. Yeah. Are you going to agree, Bert? Just a, a quick yeah. thing about our partnership with Fort McHenry. Uh, we have our education director here today, and uh, we we do a lot of preliminary things uh, at at you know at our site, and you can go to the schools too, of course, with the information. So when they come here, their experience is so much richer. You know, it's very hard to create a sense of what this is all about without any preparation. If I could add one more thing, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I should have put in a plug for our teacher ranger teacher program. Yeah, yeah. Um, in which, and I'm not sure you have it at Fort McHenry. You do, um, which I think is really the model for that mm -hmm. interaction where a teacher actually has the opportunity to work as in a park as an interpretive ranger to work with the interpreters and helping them understand their students' needs and also of getting exposed to uh, the material. So we also do um, a lot of training for our interpreters. We, we're always trying to do more, and we're also using technology to do that, such as today. Mm -hmm. So, Dominic, I'm afraid the answer is a solid 50-50 split. <laughs> we're not going to go one way or the other. Uh, studio audience, any questions locally? How do you address a global audience when you've got a location-based experience? Uh, the future of the past lies in being able to share the content globally. Mm -hmm. So let me restate that for the video audience. When you've got a wonderful place-based experience, how do we communicate this to our global audience? Everybody's not here, they can't get here. How do we communicate our stories and our findings and our research results to them? You get it right? Okay. Let's start with you, Bert. Okay. Well, you know, you, like all, uh, all things, politics are local. Um, you start locally, but you uh, obviously, when you're going to go to a global audience, uh, there are probably a lot of uh, miscalculations about what America is all about if somebody hasn't been here. Uh, but I think at the same time, there are there are things that you can hang on to in a place like this. I mean, we're talking about the Star Spangled Banner and the flag, and so I think you can start with something like that. But um, if you get into more complex things, I'm not sure right. how you do that. I mean, you know, there's probably X amount of things that the world knows about and doesn't know about maybe all that well. Uh, so 
Yes. Mm -hmm. I know you go overseas with, uh, you know, with the Voice of America and try to <laughs> try to create <laughs> some sense to what we're all about because right. it's complicated. It is. Another complicated question. Stephanie, do you, uh, do you have a perspective on this? I do, and um, I think that you, you look at what are those basic human stories and values and themes. For example, we have a site that's somewhat remote in Idaho that is one of the sites of where um, Japanese and Japanese Americans were incarcerated during World War II. And there's not much there. Um, they, there's um, an opportunity for reconstruction, but what they have really latched on to, and which I think is so powerful, is every year they sponsor a symposium on human rights. And that theme raises Minidoka's personal stories and tragedies to a whole nother level. It connects them with the stories of um, current populations in the US, such as Muslim Americans, who have similarly felt backlash during a time of war and conflict. And I think that's how you make those connections, is you, you dig down to those basic elements of the human story. Okay. Amy, I know you're in Baltimore, but you have international students, I do. right? You have a big uh, student population, diverse languages and so on. Do you have any particular approach to reaching those students that talks to this global issue? Well, I think Stephanie hits it right on the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. is bringing up those big picture essential questions that cover more than just one minute little topic in time at one place. It's bringing up these big issues. So we do have large refugee populations and we, mm -hmm. and we try to combine those issues or connect with those issues. Right. Very good, very good. And another social media question. So John asks, how do we engage with broad audiences in their 20s and 30s? Talking to kids is great, but how do you keep them as they grow? Okay. Any thought about that? Uh, we'll go back to Bert. Uh, yeah, well, I'm back to my 50% of the population doesn't really care very much about this. But um, I think that's a, that's a cop out. Um, we have a group called the Young Defenders, and they like to come and drink and have a good time. Uh, but you're always going to engage somebody when you have a big group like that. And um, I think you have to play the odds, really, basically. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to get out there, do something that they want to come to. Otherwise, they won't come. Right. And make it interesting. Uh, we had a cigar and whiskey night, but we wanted to also engage the group about the whole, uh, the whole history of, uh, of um, whiskey and cigars. And, and it, it worked to a certain degree because it got them into uh, other things in the uh, in the exhibits, and uh, uh, you know that's that it's, it's being imaginative about really trying to find some hooks to get these young audiences, and then hit the ones who are interested, uh, because you're only going to get a certain percentage of that audience no matter what you do. Uh, they're just busy with other things, I think. Right. Very good. I think that um, you you have to enable people to see themselves and make that connection. And just as an example, in telling the story of the Civil War and of War of 1812 this year, um, during these commemorations, we've reached out and created several new publications that tell the stories of populations that aren't normally connected in people's minds with the Civil War. So we just published um, a book on American Indians in the Civil War which on the front page is prominently featured uh, the aide-de-camp of um, General Grant, who was a friend of his during his non-military years who came into the war with him, and I believe was a Cherokee? Uh, no, he was an uh, Iroquois. Iroquois, okay, yeah. Iroquois. Um, we similarly published a book on Hispanics in the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, we published a book with Parks Canada on the War of 1812. This couple of essays from the Indian perspective of what they lost as a result of the War of 1812. So by bringing in different facets of the story that we haven't told before, we're connecting with new audiences. And I think that's the power of the technology that we're talking about. We're in an age where for the first time, the, the population that dominates the press, that dominates the academics, that dominates the textbooks, doesn't control the story. Any one story 
can now be on the web. And so we're looking at the ability to tell the complexity of history in a whole new way. So Amy, you can't use the cigar and whiskey trick no, with your population. <laughs> but how do you <laughs> or maybe that's right. <laughs> but how do you maintain this sort of level of interest in your students after they leave the school system? Well, one of the tricks that educators always use is you do something where the kids perform and their parents have to come. <laughs> and we found that whether Very they good. come to see the students yeah. perform or hear them perform or that they come as chaperones on field trips, that's a way to hook them. And you have to do something great on the field trip or have the kids really perform at a great, have a great experience in the performance, but that helps get those 20, 30s, and 40-year-olds. Very good. Very good. So we have three very different approaches to answering the question. So I hope that helped, John. So I want to um, wrap up our session here with one final question I hope motivates a lot of the discussion here and, and keeps us going as we end today. I want to end by giving each of our speakers a chance to answer for just a minute or two this last question. As you contemplate the challenges in finding new ways to understand and use the past, what do you see are the new and key opportunities for broadly interdisciplinary research and action. Broadly interdisciplinary research and action. Are we talking about... Um, Let's get the mic over to you. There you go. Methods? Um, yeah, well, interdisciplinary, in other words. I know we're all, we're all struggling with the, the future of technology, and that, that is the hugest part of this whole story right, right now. Right. Um, and how much, you know, can you... Uh, can you use that and, and use it effectively since it's changing so quickly? I go back to Amazon again because they're now inventing these um, these drones that are going to take packages to the public. I mean, and they don't know if that's going to work or not. Right. And, um, and, and you know, we have so many opportunities with the, uh, with the Internet, but at the same time, there's so many opportunities for misinformation, too. Mm -hmm. um, there is a piece, an eight-minute piece on the story of the Star Spangled Banner that's been circulated widely that is absolutely and utterly and totally wrong uh, and silly. Um, and so um, how do you use this effectively to get beyond the sort of ignorance that goes along with, uh, with, the, uh, with the knowledge of a particular historical event? Right. Um, and I think we're back to that same problem again. You cannot you cannot uh, avoid the fact that one-on-one -on -one storytelling mm -hmm. that's smart and intelligent and, you know, the Park Service really uh, spends so much of its time at, at the sites concentrating on those people who know how to communicate on the site with the public. So I, I, I don't Great. think there's any substitute for that. So the Maryland Historical Society does not stand on its own. It relies also on the teachers to teach discernment critical thinking skills so that when people see these materials they understand how to evaluate them in context. We spend a lot of time uh, teaching the teachers uh, right. because it's very, very important to us to get, you know, because social studies hasn't gotten very much attention in the last uh, last yeah. decade and uh, and now that we have a, um, a real uh, attempt from the General Assembly, from our legislature, to put it back in the schools, um, it's, it's our job as sort of command central to uh, to mm -hmm. teach the teachers and, and help them uh, help them uh, get you know get excited about a particular set of uh, historical events or whatever they're teaching. Thank you, Tom. So, Stephanie, what opportunities do you see for interdisciplinary research and action? Well, I, first of all, I think um, we need to recognize that in the interdisciplinary approach hasn't always been the uh, choice, uh, the first choice, and the fact that we are going that as way as a cultural anthropologist, I feel very strongly that that's, that's a positive, um, that we understand that cultural resources are those resources that are necessary to sustain a way of life so that we see fresh air, we see um, clean water as being part of how we live and, and all of that interconnectedness. Secondly, I think that it's really important to be able to tell the complex stories that we do, whether it be teaching people about climate change through illustrating its effects on both the natural and cultural resources that we manage, or in terms of telling the complexity of 
all of the different motives for being engaged in the Civil War. So I think that that's very important, coupled with a technology that gives us the ability to bring this, these different perspectives to play in a single place is uh, really helps facilitate that conversation. Okay. Thank you. Any perspective? Well, being in charge of most of the interdisciplinary right, aspects right. in Baltimore City, yeah. we've worked really hard to try to find connections and hooks for social studies. As Bert mentioned, we've been social studies has been the redheaded stepchild for quite some time in schools, but with the Common Core standards and the idea of more interdisciplinary mm -hmm. skills, uh, we work really hard mm -hmm. to make those connections with the music, with the art, um, the environmental literacy tours that we've had here at, at the port as well. I think that what would be very helpful to those of us in this field who work with schools and with teachers and with students is to really get hard research, like the research that I quoted on art museums, but to get research to prove that these types of experiences that we're providing for our students are actually useful and make a difference in their lives. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of our panelists today. And on behalf of the Future of Information Alliance, I want to thank our hosts here at Fort McHenry, the National Park Service, the University of Maryland Department of Research, and all of the participating sponsors and hosts, and to all of you here at the audience for participating. I also want to thank the people watching on Video Land. Good job. <laughs> uh, this will be up later this week, available as a video cast, so you can watch it again if you haven't caught it live on the live stream. You can check it out on the Information of In uh, Future of Information Alliance. It's FIA dot umd dot edu. You can see what else is coming up this week and there are many more exciting programs. I recommend you check them out and how you can participate. Even if you can't make it in person, you can attend a lot of these events through the live stream medium. We hope you get a chance to take part. Thank you very much for attending. Okay. Um, is this is now not a, yeah. <laughs> thank you um